Thank you all very much for being here. It's great to have you for one of our Center for Preaching events. We've been doing this series on lessons I learned from the mistakes I've made in preaching uh, for the last year or so, having different folks come in or from our own faculty answer that question, what are the mistakes you've made in preaching and what have you learned from them? And uh, I've made plenty of mistakes, so I have a long list. I've actually had to cut it back. So I've made many, many mistakes. But before we begin, let's pray together. Lord God, we are grateful, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we are able to gather in this place, in this institution, to be able to study your word, wrestle with its meaning, deal with its context, and then communicate it to your people. We have a tremendous responsibility in doing just that because your word tells us that we will be judged more strictly than all the others. And that uh, presents with us some special challenges because we have committed ourselves then to study to show ourselves approved of God so that we might rightly divide it. And as we have rightly divided it, we might rightly speak it and teach your people how they might reflect Christ, and uh, live lives that honor you. So in these moments together, help us to learn together. Bless the time that we spend together. Uh, use the food to strengthen us, and use the words that we share amongst each other to strengthen our souls as well. And we'll thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, who gave himself for us, we pray. Amen. There are some more seats up front here, folks, here. Uh, one here, so. <clears throat> so, uh, the lessons I learned from the mistakes I've made in preaching. That's me, Scott M. Gibson. I'm, I'm willing to label myself with this list. And, uh, of course, any list is going to be idiosyncratic. That is, any list is going to be a list that... Uh, I, myself, as a preacher, have wrestled with. They may not be issues with which you have wrestled or perhaps even will wrestle with, but nevertheless, these are some of the uh, lessons that I've learned. And so I'm going to share with you what these lessons are. The first lesson is the people to whom I speak aren't an audience. I'm not there to entertain them, but my role is to teach them God's word, will, and way. In a culture where entertainment is one of the chiefest values that we have, there's a tendency for us as preachers to see ourselves as entertainers. And I learned that lesson as a young preacher. Uh, my background when I was in high school was in uh, uh, theater and doing uh, performances. I had a friend of mine and I, we would go around from church to church, rotary clubs and all of that, and do impressions. We would do imitations on political figures, actors, and actresses. So it was very easy for me to feel a sense of acclaim or wanting the applause of people when I would stand up to preach. Wasn't that a great, wasn't that a great sermon? Help, help, affirm me, affirm me, affirm me. Uh, because it, what I saw so much in entertainment was this vast, vacuous desire to be affirmed. And yes, that's the case that we all want to be affirmed. We want to be encouraged and so forth. But that was not the reason why I would get up to preach. And it's a hard lesson especially when you're preaching and you have people falling asleep while you're delivering God's word. Out, always on my, my right-hand side, your left, would be Dale. Dale would sit there with his arms folded, and then slowly Dale would drift off into his own little world. Every Sunday, Dale would go there. Sometimes I wish I could go with Dale myself. <laughs> but that's what would happen. And if I looked to Dale to receive my affirmation, I would be bankrupt. Because it's not about 
me being an entertainer, but me being a preacher, a teacher of God's Word. And uh, that's why for me, and this is me, idiosyncratic, I don't talk about my audience. I talk about my listeners. Now, I know that this comes from uh, uh, communication theory and, and so forth, but in preaching, we're not preaching to entertain, which has a sense of audience, but we have a sense of preaching to people who are listening or not wanting to listen, but we are in that type of, of engagement. So the lesson I learned here is that I'm not here to entertain, but I'm here to preach, to teach, to shape lives through the words that are presented through God's word through me. And uh, it's a lesson that I've had to learn and uh, one that occasionally it still creeps back into my own thinking because I like the applause. I like people to laugh. I like that. But it's, that's not the reason why I do what I do. So the first lesson is uh, the people to whom I speak aren't an audience. I'm not there to entertain them, but my role is to teach them God's word, will, and way. My second lesson is that preaching, sermon preparation, is a spiritual battle. My first church, I went there kicking and screaming. I didn't want to go to this church. I had it all planned out what I was going to do, and that was not go to this church. <laughs> I had been asked to serve as a pulpit supply in the church while they were without a pastor, and so I did. I was preaching regularly and then was approached, won't you like to become our pastor? No, 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 thank you, no, no, thank you. I had other plans. I was going to go back into graduate work, finish my degree at Oxford, do this, blah, 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 blah. I had it all planned out. So I uh, was asked uh, to continue to stay on and, and, and preach there as much as I could. The doors closed for me to return to Oxford, and the doors opened, unbeknownst to me, because it was very difficult for me to see that uh, I was to stay there as the pastor. But at first I said, I'll be your interim for a while. So while I was the interim, they still asked me if I would become the pastor of the church, and eventually I became pastor of the church. Part of the reason why I didn't want to become pastor of this particular church is the reputation that this church had. It had a terrible reputation. It had a reputation of chewing up pastors and spitting them out. And I thought, I don't want to be chewed up and I don't want to be spit out, okay? So I can avoid that. But what ended up happening was I moved into the parsonage while I was serving as the interim. It was a big parsonage. It had uh, two living rooms, a dining room, a big foyer, a big kitchen, five bedrooms. It was, it was really nice. If there was anything I would have wanted to take away from that church when I finally left was the house. It was a great <laughs> house. So I, I moved into the parsonage, but what I discovered is they moved into my heart. And I uh, stayed there. But the reality of the tension and the struggle that, this, that existed in this church was something that was almost overwhelming for me. I can remember preparing sermons in my study at the parsonage, and I was prone on the floor or on my back, weeping, asking that God would help me to prepare a sermon that these people could be benefited from because my soul was in such torment in trying to work with all the tensions that existed in this church. It was a spiritual battle. I was almost left uh, uh, stunned, um, uh, weak from trying to study. And I, 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 I worked with the Greek, I worked with the Hebrew, I worked with all, but to be able to take that and say, here is how this text has an impact on your life. It was a battle. And sometimes what I discovered is that I, I couldn't win that battle until, or at least try to 
to uh, climb the hill of that battle until sometime Saturday. And I'm not, I didn't want to, because I had uh, three preparations a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, mon- uh, Wednesday night. And, and so <laughs> it, it was a tremendous battle. Oftentimes when I was sitting in the seminary class, I thought, oh, it's going to be wonderful. I get to study God's word and preach to God's people. And it's great. But getting to the pulpit meant that I had a lot of minefields to go through, a lot of skirmishes uh, with which I had to uh, deal with. And it wasn't easy. It was not easy at all. It was worth it. That's one of the lessons that I see. But, it was, but it was, the reality is, is that it was not, not easy at all. Uh, being able to discern that and navigate through it with God's good grace was a big challenge. And so when I was in that situation, the seminary classroom, which was behind me, seemed so far away, so long ago, because what was learned in the hallowed halls of of Gordon-Conwell was great stuff, but applying it, living it, preparing for it was something that I had not even been prepared for. And I don't blame Gordon-Conwell for that. I just see that as the reality of what it means to do pastoral ministry, to preach in any given context. Preaching is a spiritual battle. And then, associated with this, then, is the matter of prayer. And this might be, it seems so obvious to you. Of course, you took you that long to learn that lesson. Well, uh, I've got to tell you, since preaching is a spiritual battle, uh, prayer is the armor that we want to use in order to engage. And I'll tell you, I prayed. I really prayed. Um, That church, for example, I had a a man who was part of the entire historical system-oriented fabric of that church who was uh, one of the most difficult people with whom to deal. And I prayed for him every day. I still pray for him and his wife every day. They were very difficult people and gave difficult time to every pastor who was before me and after me as well. And also then being able to pray how God would help me to have the wisdom to know how to preach to these people in the midst of these very challenging experiences. And they're wonderful people. Uh, Other church... uh, Different situation, uh, prayer, of course, is, is, was still uh, um, um, the important element in dealing with the uh, confrontations and the difficulties. Sometimes we think, as, as if we go through uh, Robinson's 10 steps towards getting your pr- sermon together, you know, that's all you need, but it is something that is bathed in prayer and that you pray for God's goodness and God's grace to communicate his word, because without prayer, uh, we're hopeless. Because what prayer does is it is an act that says, I am, as a preacher, dependent on someone who is stronger than I am. I can't do this on my own strength, only through the strength of God. And we know that but the question is, do we actually practice it? And that is a lesson that I've learned. Another lesson is that uh, fear fear in preaching is okay. I think it depends on the type of fear that we have. Sometimes we stand up and we're fearful that the listeners would like us or not. Do, do Do they like me? I hope they like me. I'm I'm really afraid if they like me. It's not about you. It's about God. And so the fear that I'm talking about is the responsibility fear, the responsibility fear factor of 
being a, a, a minister, a, a messenger of God, handling God's word appropriately, and being fearful that I am handling it appropriately. That's the kind of fear that's all right to have. I, I have this little book given to me by uh, the pastor who um, shepherded me through seminary as a, a, a young man from western Pennsylvania. Uh, pastor Bickley was uh, such a dear, dear man. He held off his retirement until I graduated from seminary so that he could oversee my ordination. And he gave me this little book. And this is a book of um, Martin Luther's Table Talk. And in this uh, little book, uh, Martin Luther says this, When a man first comes into the pulpit, he is much perplexed to see so many heads before him. When I stand there, I look upon none, but imagine they are all blocks that are before me. Uh, he is saying that he stands before God and before the people, and he recognizes that he's not there to uh, entertain them. He's not there to uh, do anything except to recognize that he is handling God's word. And in handling God's word, we are reminded that it is all right to be fearful. Because fear, you know, phobos, fear is a recognition of somebody in greater than we are. What does the writer of the Proverbs say? But the, what? The beginning of wisdom is what? Fearing the Lord. Recognizing who this God is, that this God is God. And if this God is God, then I have a responsibility to communicate his word with fear and with trembling because the fear represents my recognition of who he is and it is an expression of my worship to him. So uh, it's, it's this act of preaching and the expression of fear. I still am fearful every time I stand in the pulpit. I'm fearful that I handle the word well. And I don't ever want that fear to dissipate. Lesson five is one sermon is like one meal in a healthy, lifelong diet. Sometimes as a young preacher, I thought, I've got to give them everything I have in this sermon. So I put everything, all my exegesis, all my cultural study, my historical studies, everything, and I put it into a big dump truck, and then boop, 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 boop. <laughs> I back it up, and I dump it onto my listeners, forgetting that this is only, in a sense, one small meal in an entire diet of a Christian's life. It's one small bite in a much larger meal so that I don't have to gag my listeners with all this information, but to recognize that it is part of a long continuum towards their growth in Christ. Now, that's one of the reasons why the, the, the book I wrote uh, called Preaching with a Plan talks about moving this, these listeners, our disciples, the people who are in the congregation, from one spiritual level of maturity to the next. It's not going to happen overnight. As pastors, we would love for that to be the case. If it's a toddler type of church, I have it categorized in different kinds of age groups. That is infant, toddler, uh, child, um, adolescent, uh, young adult, middle-aged adult, older adult. Where does the church fit on the continuum? And some churches are always, they're always toddler churches, what about me? Eh. Or there are even infant churches, and yet it takes time uh, for the infant to grow into an 
a, a toddler and for the toddler to move to a child. So to recognize that, that it takes time. Now the reality is in our American culture, Western culture, and probably it's reflected in, around the world, is that some churches stay the same. They're always a baby church. We've always been a baby church. Can't we be treated that way? But the reality is, is that my call to preaching is to help move these believers towards maturity. But it only happens one meal at a time. And so uh, it's helped me not to think that I have to give my listeners everything. And you'll say, I studied 20 hours, or I studied 10 hours, or however long it is, and I need to give them everything. <sighs> so you get that, the hose, and you hose them all down, and everybody's laying there in the pews, all wet with your, uh, your information, and you say, wow, I'm glad I got that out. <laughs> but the reality is, it takes uh, time. And you know, if you really thought about it, you may not remember the meal that you had last Wednesday night, but that meal helped you to get to where you are on this particular Wednesday. So it's one meal at a time. <laughs> it's easy as a young pastor to think I know more than I actually know. Uh, oh, yes, I understand the problems that you've gone through. And how old are you? 28. Uh, um, my first pastoral ministry visit was when I went to see Mr. Myers. I had gotten a call. Uh, Mr. Myers had gone into the hospital. And I was asked by his wife if I would please go to see Mr. Myers. And he had been coming. He's an he's a, a early 70-ish year old man, handsome man with his hair combed back and a small uh, mustache, dre always dressed nicely. And so I made my way 20 miles away to see Mr. Myers. Went to the front desk, got the information as to what room he was in, and walked back to his room. Mind you, this is, I am green. And I had not been to this hospital before, had hardly ever visited, although I did some pastoral ministry visitations when I was in seminary, but this was my first solo deal, okay? So I'm walking down the hallway, and I enter into the room, and Mr. Myers is laying in bed. Hello, Mr. Myers. Hello, Pastor Gibson. Wasn't that, it sounded so good, didn't it? Pastor Gibson. It, sounded, it really had a nice ring to it. Uh, hello. And, uh, of course, I thought I knew everything about hospital visitation. So uh, it was almost as if uh, Mr. Myers got a sense as to he was the cat and I was the mouse. So I walked in. I said hello to Mr. Myers, hello, Pastor Gibson. And I said, so uh, when did you come in? I came in by ambulance uh, last night. He said, yes, and there was a twinkle in his eye. And I said, uh, so uh, um, what happened? Well, the twinkle got bigger. I didn't see it. He said, so uh, Pastor, do you know how I got into this uh, state of having a heart attack and why I ended up in the hospital? I said, no. Meow. I could just, I could just feel be, myself being batted around. And he said, well, he said, um, um, I was having sex with my wife, and I had a heart attack. <laughs> and, 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 and he was just waiting for me to, and I didn't know quite what to do. <laughs> and sometimes we think we know more than we know, and it's reflected in our preaching as well. Because what ends up happening is, is that our illustrations become almost distant and um, textbooky or internet taken. We don't think about how the text strikes our own lives and where we could speak to people where they actually are. It's easy for us to deal with things in terms of... Um, abstractions. But sometimes what happens is, is that our life hasn't caught up to where we are. And you know what? It's all right to admit that. 
to admit that I'm young. I'm, I'm not as experienced as I uh, think I am. And to uh, experience the embrace of the congregation because they're recognizing that you understand who you are and that you're comfortable in your own skin. And so it, it's, it's, it's important for us to, to think about this because it's a lesson that I learned. I don't know as much as I... I hear people... I, I, some of you know that my doctoral work was in A.J. Gordon and his life and preaching. And I talked to somebody the other day and said, oh, yes, I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm a, uh, a, a, an expert in A.J. Gordon. I said, oh, oh, great, great, I'm glad you are. My own experience was I can't imagine that you would have studied all that I had studied. But nevertheless, if you want to believe it, and that's often the case. I'm an expert in living life. I'm an expert at making these. I'm an expert in we're all continuously learning. That's why it's so wonderful to recognize that we are called disciples, and you know what the word disciple means. It means learner. Inside my office, if you come in the door, on the left-hand side of the door, I have a plate there that is used in, in Australia and in Britain. When somebody is learning to drive, you have to put one of these uh, uh, plates on the car, and um, it's either a a yellow with a big L, or it's white with a big red L. And it says, oh, I'm a learner. And that's what we all are. We're learners. And so we don't know as much as we think we actually know. This one is uh, the results of preaching are really up to God. Uh, it's a lesson that... I've learned over the years because I may have a desire that something happens, something changes, and changes quickly because that's what I want to see take place as a pastor. But the reality is, is that God is sovereign, God is over all this, and no matter what I do, I can't manipulate the changes, but to recognize that God is the one who is in charge. Yeah, you can again say, like prayer, I know this. <laughs> but when you're trying to move a church towards maturity, when you're trying to do things and see that it's not going as uh, well or as quickly as I would like, to recognize that God is the one who is ultimately in control. God is sovereign. And uh, we can rest in that and be comfortable with it. It doesn't mean that we give up on it, no, but that we continue to do what God's called us to do, but to recognize that he is the one who's going to elicit the uh, results in the lives of the listeners. Actually, I had, uh, I don't know what happened on this, Joe, but I had another one or two on here. On an, I, uh, at least I thought I did, but maybe I didn't save it. But nevertheless... <laughs> <laughs> That's another mistake I've made <laughs> in, uh, in preaching. And uh, let's just see if um, it, it, it will uh, show up here. Uh, let's just move this out of the way and uh, go here. Yeah, and, and so um, these are some of the lessons that, that I've, I've learned that... Um, I trust that you can benefit from as uh, ah, here we go. Uh, I guess I guess that's it. Yeah, I, I'm still learning. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm still learning, and uh, and as I continue to to learn, um, I trust that that is something that you will do there are all kinds of mistakes that I've made and all, all manner of mistakes that you will make. But the key for us is learning from them. One of the problems that a lot of preachers have is that they, as I say to some of my students, is we get in our own way and we don't learn from the things that have been, in a sense, taught us and sometimes repeatedly taught us. And I in the same way. So uh, the lessons that I learned are, let me review them. The people to whom I speak are, are my listeners, not an audience. Sermon preparation is a spiritual battle. 
prayer is vital. Fear and preaching is okay. A sermon is like one meal at a, uh, in a healthy, lifelong diet. Oh, there's one. Not every church or congregation uh, I've preached to is the same. It's, it's not. Um, they're, they're different, and, uh, and that's a lesson I won't. And sometimes I think I know more than I know. The results of preaching are really up to God, and I'm still learning. So, comments, questions, engagement. Um, what else can I learn from you? How do you, who do you turn to for critique of your message when you're, by your, when you're by yourself? Yep, when you're by yourself. The question is, who do you turn to for a critique? I, I chose a, a, a person in my congregation. His name was Walt. And Walt was one of the few, in the first church I had, one of the few um, educated people in the church and um, was a, able to do some evaluation. And he was a type of person who I specifically chose because of his educational background and his experience. He was a used car salesman, and he was so unlike a used car salesman that you would ever want to meet. Gentle, sweet, mild man. And he was somebody who had a hearing disability. So I chose him because I wanted to be able to speak clearly, because that's one of the things that uh, uh, congregations get frustrated about, is the preacher speaks quickly and not in uh, a way that is articulated. And so listeners are often lost because of our, uh, the way we speak, uh, our rate and so forth, and our projection. Sometimes we think that this thing is going to be the savior of us. If, even if we have a quiet voice, this is not going to help us if we don't project it. And a lot of churches don't have the capacity to have somebody who understands even how this works, and you are often on your own by preaching. So... Uh, with your natural voice unamplified. But what I would do is I would meet with Walt periodically, probably once a month, and we would talk about my sermons. And it takes some humility on your part, and it takes some grace on his part <laughs> to be able to sit down and to speak with you honestly about your sermons. And uh, that, was a, that was a great uh, thing for me. He, he would sit there and he'd scratch his head. He was very shy. Well, I didn't quite understand in the sermon he preached on um, providence. What, 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 what? Oh, providence. What does that mean? And so I, would, I, I, I was able to work with him to see how important it was for me to define or to explain something, what have you. And it was, it was really a good opportunity for me to hear what, somebody else has to say about my preaching. And uh, he, he was gentle. He was friendly. Sometimes people say, if you're, if you're married, you say your spouse will uh, critique your sermons. I, I vote against that. But that, that's something. That <laughs> after you've preached, you don't want anybody to say, that was a terrible. In fact, I know somebody whose wife critiqued him so much in his preaching, he's out of pastoral ministry. It was so devastating. The person that he had hoped would affirm him was somebody who vehemently critiqued him and told. And, and she didn't have any uh, any seminary training at all, but she was saying, "This is how a sermon ought to be done," and so forth. And it it so deflated him that uh, it was difficult. Now, someone said, "Well, my wife was, wouldn't do that to me." Well, she might silently be suffering in silence, or your spouse and husband might be suffering in silence. I don't know. But it's something to think about in terms of getting somebody who's actually more objective for you to deal with, with that. And, of course, then the Center for Preaching has Sermon Doctor and so forth. But that's a small uh, little advertisement on the side. Any other questions? I'm, I'm not very far along. So I haven't had, all these, had the preaching classes, so hopefully it's not a stupid question, but I'll throw it out there. Uh, just thinking about the few classes I've had so far and being at this multi-denominational school, you, know, you hear different thoughts and different opinions and on theology and different people coming to Scripture in different ways. Um, and I'm just wondering what happens when you are preaching on something that you're, you're just not sure, but you could go either way. Like, <laughs> you, you have to say something. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just wondering what, yeah. 
flood in that kind of situation? Well, in, in that way, you make the most prayerful theological uh, um, uh, decision that is, be- is closest to you. Uh, the one church I served uh, in the uh, statement of faith is uh, a statement on premillennialism. Not dispensationalist, but a premillennialist statement. Yeah. And I'm a premillennialist, so I'm not dispensationalist, okay? But I'm a premillennialist. And so um, I was pastoring the church, and one of the things that I decided to do was to have what we called a, um, in the fall, we called it um, um, Christian Studies Institute, and we offered different kinds of classes. And I wanted to show folks that on that issue that there were different positions that people take. And there's a book called Meaning of Millennium by George Elton Ladd, and I, we, I walked with them through that. Each week I presented the uh, positions in that, in that book. And uh, one of my theology professors here was Roger Nicole. Dr. Nicole wrote a series of articles, just a marvelous, gentle, sweet man. And he wrote a series of articles on how to engage in um, disagreements with somebody and yet respect the other person. There are three articles that he, he wrote. Excellent, excellent. So I then took that position that each of the positions on the millennium, I presented as if I believed it, okay? And so I would present, or a couple of them, one of them in particular, I thought, well, I don't know, I can't do that. But anyway, <laughs> but I, I did my best, and I tried to present it fairly and so forth. And one of my deacons came up to me after I uh, gave a very good presentation on millennialism. He came up to me, and he said, you know what? He said, one of my head deacons, he said, you know what? I believe that. <laughs> <laughs> so I did a pretty good job. Uh, uh, but it's, it's a matter of presenting positions fairly and, uh, um, and then being able to show the critique in a fair way. Uh, Nicole would say, if you're giving a discussion on a particular matter, uh, imagine that your opponent is sitting in the room with you. How would you actually present his or her uh, arguments in, 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 the, um, in the presentation? And it's something to think about. Anyway, it's almost 1 o'clock. If anybody wants to uh, have further discussion, that's great. But I, I wanted you to see and share with me some of the reflections on some of the lessons that I've learned from the mistakes I've made in preaching. And I'll let you learn from the mistakes that you make as well. Thank you.